As of you traveled far, there's still some people coming, but uh, we're going to start. We don't want to delay it too long. It's great to see you all here today. And I uh, hope you come with hearts prepared and uh, to receive the word. And um, yeah, I just have a few requests to make, just if your cell phone is on, because we're recording and that, just please switch it off um, so it doesn't interfere with the, the recording. And then... Um, at the end of the session, at the, at the back, you can go and look there at the table if you want to uh, see anything. We'll, we'll, we'll have some of Jacob's books available and that sort of thing, but it will be for after teaching and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it again. Um, if we could just bow our heads and pray. Father, we just come before you with humble and open hearts, Lord. Lord, we, um, we trust that you have arrange this gathering and Lord we trust that that you are able to lead this gathering Lord we just ask that through your grace you would would teach us today by your Holy Spirit Father that you would give us the understanding we require for the days in which we live and for the purposes for which you've called us that we might glorify your name in your name alone Lord I pray that you would be gracious to the speaker and give him the strength and uh, and the courage to proclaim your word accurately. And Lord, I just thank you again for each person that is here, who you gathered by your loving hand. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Everyone can hear. <laughs> Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 4. Matthew, chapter 4. Verse 13, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea before the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Jesus goes from Nazareth to Capernaum. Capernaum is in the tribal region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Why did he go there? His ministry was based in Galilee, was on the Roman road, was a taxation station. There were logistical reasons. But conspicuously, he avoided the major city, the Roman city of Tiberias. He didn't go to Tiberias. As far as we have any biblical record of, the ministry of Jesus was on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, from Magdala, where Mary Magdalene was, around to, um, that is on the northwest, around the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, past Capernaum to Bethsaida, and then down as far as Gensarin, Gensarin. He didn't go to the Roman city. It would have made a lot more sense strategically if he's going to have a Galilee-based ministry to be based in Tiberius, but he doesn't go there. Doesn't go there. It was a Roman city with hot springs and so forth, but he doesn't go there. Likewise, as a kid, if he was going to live in the area of Galilee he lived in, it should be Sephorus. Sephorus, the district Roman capital. Some people think that was the city on the hill. 
but he didn't live in Sephoris. He lived in Nazareth. I wish I had a board I could write on. Is there a flip chart? If there isn't, it's okay, I can explain it, but it's better to write on it. The question is, why did he choose to live in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali? Now remember, the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes always derive from Jacob's prophecy in Genesis chapter 49. The entire history of salvation for both Israel and the church depends upon and derives from Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49 to the 12 tribes. Actually, it's to the 12 sons, but each son represents a tribe of which the son is the patriarch. And we see the characteristics of those tribes <coughs> played out in Old Testament and in New Testament history. But they project ahead from Genesis to the book of Revelation, chapter 7 and chapter 14. It begins in Genesis 49, but those 12 tribes still come into play at the end of the age, even after the rapture. After the rapture and resurrection, the purposes of God become primarily focused on Israel and the Jews. Once the faithful church is removed, the purpose of God is focused primarily on Israel and the Jews. Be careful of those who say the rapture is going to trigger a great revival. It is not. Once the rapture takes place, the time of the Gentiles will come to a close very quickly. The age of the church per se is over. Now we're into the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy of chapter 9, and there will not be a great revival. There will be a pouring out of God's spirit on Israel, but under very desperate, desperate circumstances. So whenever you see a mention of the tribes, there's a reason, and it's important. When Jesus lives in Nazareth, we have a verse, he shall be called a Nazarene in chapter 2, verse 23. He shall be called a Nazarene. And it says, this is a prophecy. These kinds of prophecies, this is what was written, are called formula citations. Formula citations. Prophecies specifically about Jesus, this is fulfilling that, is known as a formula citation. That's what a theologian would call it. The problem is, however, it says this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Notice it's prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. There is no such verse anywhere in the Old Testament. No such verse. How do we explain this? In Biblical Hebrew, we have word play. In modern English, when we use wordplay, that is one word that sounds like another, and we substitute a word with another word that sounds like it, or it is spelled like it with one letter difference, we usually do it as a joke or as an advertising gimmick. When I was a little boy in New York, there was an advert in a newspaper of a company that sold coal. And it was called Quality Coal. K-O-A-L. They misspelled it intentionally to draw people's attention to the advert. Okay. In English, we use it as an advertising gimmick or a joke. Let us synchronize our watches. Let us sympathize our watches. Something like that. But in Hebrew, it is very, very different. In Biblical Hebrew, it's to draw our attention to something serious. They obviously did not have the technology we have, so the scribes, 
the scribes called the Sofrim had certain techniques they would use to highlight, to do the equivalent of what we will call highlighting, italicizing, and underlining. There were no chapter divisions in the original Hebrew canon. So to mark the beginning of a passage or a per pericope, they would bolden the letter. Bolden the letter. Instead of having an ordinary letter, like Shin, that's the SH sound in Hebrew. Shin comes from tooth, looks like a teeth. Yeah, that's what it means, tooth. Instead of having an ordinary Shin, in order to make it the equivalent of a chapter, as we would have it now, they would do it something like this. They would bolden it, as opposed to the other letters. They would simply bolden it. The other letters would be written like this, but they'd bold it. That was one literary device. Okay. They wanted to italicize something, the equivalent of italicization, they would change the size of the font of the text, okay, and perhaps move the margin. That's what they would do. But if they wanted to, the equivalent of underline something, to point something out as not just emphatic, but the cardinal verse upon which the rest of the passage depends. Okay. They would do something else. They would use different kinds of wordplay in Hebrew and in Aramaic to make something emphatic. You say it twice. The King James says verily, verily, or truly, truly. Okay. If it was cold out today, and you asked me if it was cold, and I wanted to say very cold, I, I, I wouldn't say very cold in, in Hebrew. I'd say cold, cold. Cut, 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 cut. Hot, very hot, hum, hum. You'd say something twice in literary Hebrew to make it emphatic. Okay. But you would also change spelling. Change spelling. Look with me, please, to the book of Amos. Chapter 8 is a very good example. Verse 1, thus the Lord showed me, and behold, there was a basket of summer fruit. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. <coughs> then the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. The end has come. If the fruit is not harvested by summer, the sun in the Middle East burns it up. I'll just put this one in Latin letters. Caius. Caius. Priya Caius. Summer. Summer. Termination. End, as in terminal end. Kets. What do you see, Amos? I see a basket of Priha Kayets. 
The cats has come from my people. You understand? Wordplay in Hebrew is not a joke or an advertising gimmick. It's a way to draw people's attention to something very, very important upon which the rest of the context depends. Okay? So, there's no such verse, and he shall be called a Nazarene. It's not in there. Rabbis try to make a big deal out of the fact that it's not in there, but they don't tell you the truth. There's a lot of wordplay in Semitic literature, in, in, in Jewish literature. <laughs> In Hebrew, Nezer, Nezer, Nazarene, Branch, Netzel, Nezer, Netzel. There's no verse that says he shall be a Nezer. But there is, there are verses that say he shall be a Netzer, a righteous branch. Look with me to Jeremiah 23. Verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a Netzer Tzadik, a righteous branch. <laughs> now, the rabbis, and he will reign as king and act wisely. The rabbis agree this is a prophecy about the Messiah. He'll do justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved. The rabbis agree this is a prophecy about the Messiah. But it says, <coughs> prophets, look with me to Isaiah chapter 11. <coughs> the Messiah is the Shoresh Ishai, the root of Jesse. Chapter 11, verse 1, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. S somewhat different word, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit, the spirit of the Lord will be upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, etc. Everybody see that? That's that. You use one word that sounds like another to draw people's attention to something. Okay. Everybody understand why it's like that? It's not a mistake. It's deliberate. It's intentional. It's scribal technique. And of course, Academic rabbis know this, but ordinary rabbis who try to persuade Jewish people not to believe in Jesus will say, look, there's no such verses. They're not being honest or they're ignorant themselves. Well, everybody understand what I'm saying here? He comes to Capernaum. Kafar Nahum. Kafar Nahum. Literally, the village of Nahum or the village of the one who is consoled. Nahum means consoled or consolation. It's the name of one of the prophets. Now, this is not the village where the prophet Nahum came from, but it has that name, the village of the one who is consoled. Kafar Nahum. There's a reason he dwells in the places he does. They have a spiritual Meaning, everybody with me so far? We're not just talking about geography for the sake of geography. The geography has a spiritual meaning. Now pay attention. The 12 tribes of Israel are the names of tribes deriving from the sons of Jacob. Each tribe is in the character of the founding father. You've got the major patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, but then you have a patriarch or a prince, a Tsar of each tribe. 
these princes are what is known in theological jargon as corporate solidarities. Corporate solidarities. A corporate solidarity is where one person represents a larger group of people. Hence the nation Israel, when it's ethnocentric for the Jews, is frequently in the Old Testament called Jacob. He's not addressing Jacob the patriarch, he's addressing the descendants of Jacob. Somehow the Jews are in the character of Jacob. When you see Jacob in Israel, after Jacob wrestles with the angel of the Lord, which was a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus, his name was changed to Israel. When Jacob behaved like an old creation, Genesis goes back to calling him Jacob. When he behaves like a new creation, as it were, in the Old Testament sense, the text calls him Israel. Well, we get a new name when we're born again, a new name in heaven. When we behave according to our old natures, the Lord calls us by our name. Bill, Dorothy, Beatrice, Max, whatever it is. But when we behave like new creations, we have a new name. Okay? Now, Israel is inclusive. The church, non-Jews, are grafted into Israel in a spiritual sense, into the covenants. Not to the replacement of the Jews, but the language of incorporation. Jacob is ethnocentric. It's specifically for Israel. When you see a prophecy about Jacob, it's something specifically for the Jews. It is in no primary sense applicable to the church. Like the time of Jacob's trouble. Hatekofat Hatsorat Yaakov. Okay? Everybody understand what I'm saying? <coughs> so we have these tribes. Now, in addition to being 12 sons of Jacob and being 12 tribes, there are 12 shires or counties or regions, geographically designated regions whose boundaries were set by the apportionment of Joshua. When a woman married a guy from another tribe, she took his tribal identity. Everybody understand? You take the tribal identity of your husband. So Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. Then how could he be the cousin of John the Baptist, whose father was a high priest and had to be from the tribe of Levi? Because Mary or her mother Mary's mother married a Levite, you understand? And she took the identity of her husband's tribe. Everybody understand? It's like if you marry somebody who's English and you become eligible for a British passport and you move to the UK, you get the identity of the person that you married for legal purposes even though you may be born in South Africa, legally you are British or vice versa. Okay? So there are 12 tribes. Now people sometimes ask, well how can God get the 12 tribes back together? Right now, we have mitochondrial DNA. When I was in university, nobody knew there was cytoplasmic DNA. We, it, I was taught in university that it was that DNA was in the nucleus of the cell. There was RNA in the cytoplasm, but DNA was only in the nucleus. That's what I was taught when I was a kid at university. That was all rubbish. Now we know that there is cytoplasmic, specifically mitochondrial DNA. It can trace way back. <laughs> Bone tissue, hard tissue, deteriorates much slower than soft tissue. You can find <laughs> bones that are very old. <laughs> Hypothetically, if you can get enough bone tissue from archaeological excavations in each region, 
to get enough distinctive signatures, not just by ethnicity, but by tribe, by family, by clan. And you can match the DNA of Jews that exist today. It is not unthinkable that we can work out which tribe a Jew is from. This technology is getting better. For nearly 20 years, such experimentation has been going on in Israel to find the priesthood. Jews with Levitical names like Cohen and Levi and Levinson and Siegel. Uh, as of about 12 years ago, they already had 252 Jews with Levitical names that they know their ancestors were related to each other. There's two yeshivas in Jerusalem dedicated to not just seeing the temple rebuilt, but resurrecting the Aaronic priesthood. These people are very serious. I've met some of them. They're quite serious. And they're employing top genetic scientists. Top. From the States and from Israel. Top. They're very serious about it. It's not unthinkable that they can do this eventually for the tribes. Right now, it's like you spit into a test tube and send it in and they tell you whatever. <clears throat> this technology gets better all the time. This technology gets better all the time. I only mention this in passing. So these 12 sons of Jacob correspond to 12 tribes, but they correspond also to 12 geographical regions. <laughs> Call them counties or shires. Okay? With this in view, let's go back now. Whenever you see the tribes, the Holy Spirit inspired the name of the tribe to be put in there for a reason. Let's turn to Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49. <laughs> Let's begin in verse 8, his prophecy to the tribe of Judah. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Now Judah means praise, Yehuda, praises of Yahweh. <coughs> it's the same word as hallelujah. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you've gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion who dares to rouse him up, the lion of Judah, Ariye Yehuda. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter, government. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the submission or the obedience of the people. The rabbis say correctly that Shiloh represents the Messiah or is the Messiah. Shiloh was the capital of Israel for 200 years, but again, we've got to go to what the word means. Shiloh. Shiloh is apostle, sent, the one who is sent. Remember Jesus told the blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam? In Hebrew, Shiloh, literally the pool of the apostles, <laughs> of the apostle, of the one who was sent, where the living water came from, the Maim Haim, give the Holy Spirit in John 7. It all means something. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Yes. The 
pool of souls where they got the living water, the Mayim Hayim, for John 7, for the ritual that the, that's called Simcha Bet Shoiva. You can read about it in Josephus and in the Mishnah. And the stairway, where the procession was from the Pool of Siloam to the Temple Mount is fully excavated now. You can actually see it and walk on part of it. The archaeology confirms it precisely. And the Pool of Siloam, the original one, is 80% excavated now. It's magnificent what the archaeologists have done. And I believe that it's, God has allowed that to happen for apologetic reasons, to confirm mm -hmm. the accuracy of the scriptures and help us to understand the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So the living water would come from the one who was sent. You understand how Hebrew works. He's the Messiah, <laughs> but he's the one who was sent. In Greek, apostolo, apostolo, apo, the one who goes out. Jesus is called in Hebrews for the apostle. There are apostles, but he is the apostle. He is the one who was sent. And the rabbis have a sense of this. They say this is about the Messiah. So the scepter, the government, would not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Jerusalem is in Judah. Pay attention. Herod the Great, not called the Great because he was a great guy, he was a lousy guy, but he was a great builder. He was ethnically Arab, Idumean. <coughs> by ethnicity. By religion, he was a Jew. In the Hasmonean period, the Idumeans, Edomites, some of them converted to Judaism and settled in the northern Negev. His parents were among them. But culturally and politically, and by way of citizenship, he was a Roman. Now it's a separate subject, but Herod the Great is a major type of the Antichrist. A way, the way, in large part, he will be able to make a false peace in the Middle East is because the Jews consider him to be a Jew, the Arabs consider him to be an Arab, and the Europeans consider him to be a European. The Jews said Herod was a Jew. The Arabs said he's an Arab. But the Romans said he was a Roman. This was unusual. Once the Herodians went, the Romans sent Pontius Pilate. The scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. When Jesus came, the scepter departed from Judah. After the house of Herod, the Roman capital of Judea was moved to Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea, on the Mediterranean coast. That's where Pilate's headquarters actually was. It was no longer in Jerusalem. The scepter literally geographically departed from Judah, and there was no more Jewish king. The Romans sent a proconsul. They sent Pontius Pilate after that. The scepter departed from Judah. The prophecy was literally fulfilled. Does everybody understand? Mm -hmm. When the Messiah came, the scepter would depart from mm -hmm. Judah. Because only Jesus now can be called King of the Jews. You understand? Wow. Only Jesus can be called King of the Jews. Although the Antichrist will try to put himself in that position in some sense, only Jesus can be the king of the Jews. Once the Messiah came, the scepter departed from Judah. Everybody got it? Let's continue now looking at these prophecies. Okay. Let's look at the prophecy to Benjamin in 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, and in the evening he divides the spoil. Does everybody see the prophecy about Benjamin? Yeah. Jacob's prophecy about Benjamin. He's a ravenous wolf. Bad. But that's in the morning. In the evening he divides the spoil. 
Dividing the spoil is a Hebrew idiom for sharing in the divine reward. Remember Isaiah 53. He shall divide the booty with the strong. After the resurrection, the prophecy about Jesus and Isaiah 53. Benjamin always begins bad, but ends good. He's someone who begins bad, but ends good. Let's see how this has played out throughout history. King Saul was from what tribe? He doesn't get rid of Amalek. So a descendant of Amalek, Haman, an Agagite, direct descendant of Amalek, tries to wipe out the Jews. This is retribution for something that took place centuries earlier when Saul failed to carry out God's command. <clears throat> ancient enemies always remain ancient enemies. You understand? Rabbinic Judaism will always be the enemy of Jewish believers. Roman Catholicism will always be the enemy of biblical Christianity. Okay? Islam will always be the enemy <coughs> of believers in Jesus. Ancient enemies always remain ancient enemies. That's true among nations. In post-colonial Af Africa, after the Europeans went back, the tribes who had always been inimical began fighting each other. Hutus, Tutsis, Zulus, Khorsas, Khorsas. <laughs> <coughs> That's how it works. Ancient enemies remain ancient enemies. So Saul is bad. To put this right, to get rid of the curse of Amalek that now came through Haman. Of what tribe was Esther and Mordechai? Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin always begins badly and ends right. Esther, and, Esther Mordechai put right what Saul failed to. Everybody understand? The early Christians applied this or understood St. Paul in this light. Of what tribe was Paul the Apostle? Benjamin. He began as a ravenous wolf persecuting the church. But then he becomes an apostle to the Gentiles. It's the character of Benjamin to begin badly and end well. He divides the booty. What does Paul say? I know this stored up for me a crown of righteousness. Does everybody understand? Now, look at verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan comes to the word din, judge. Dan shall be a serpent, a nahash. A serpent is a metaphor and biblical imagery for the devil, Satan as a seducer. The dragon is Satan, the persecutor. The serpent in Revelation is the seducer, as the serpent beguiled the woman. He is a picture of Israel in the church. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so that the rider falls backwards. Now that term falls backwards in Hebrew is backslide. The same term as backslide, basically. There's something bad about Dan. This has to do with the Second golden calf in the days of Jeroboam the second, remember? He brought a curse. So when you get to Revelation chapter 7 and chapter 14, what tribe is missing? Dan. So to keep it 12, Joseph had to be split into two, didn't he? Ephraim, Menashe, and Ephraim. They had to get another one to replace him. Okay. The early Christians saw this as a prophecy of the Antichrist. There's two people called son of perdition, Judas and the Antichrist. Of the twelve, 
which one was disincluded and had to be replaced? Judas. Judas. You had to get a replacement for Judas. You understand? One goes, now you're down to 11, you got to find a replacement. The early Christians understood this and they applied it to the Antichrist and they saw it played out in Judas. If always one goes, you got to get it. Van is missing in Revelation. Everybody understand how this works? It all comes from J Jacob's prophecy. Now let's look a little bit more. Verse 13. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore. He shall be a haven for ships. And his flank shall be towards Sidon. Okay. Next to him is Issachar as a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. When he saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, he bowed, he bowed his shoulder to bear burdens and became a servant of false labor. So we have Zebulun. Zebulun has the meaning, and it doesn't really come from Hebrew, it comes from Aram, it comes from a very ancient form of Chaldee or something. Nobody's really sure. But it has the idea of dwell, dwell, or dwelling. And verse 21, Naphtali is a doe let loose. He gives beautiful words. Now Zebulun was on the Sea of Galilee. How can you sail from the Sea of Galilee to Sidon? in Lebanon. There was a river today called the Brook of Kishon. But in ancient times it was navigable. Kishon went from the Sea of Galilee where it was the border between Issachar and Zebulun. Sailing then was coastal. The Phoenicians hugged the coast. They followed the coastlines. They were not into the deep blue, they were coastal sailors. Okay. You could navigate a small ship on the Kishon into what's known as the Mifrats, the Gulf today separating the cities of Haifa and Akko, and then straight up the Mediterranean coast to Sidon. Jesus went to Sidon, didn't he, from this area. You understand? This area had to be a way to go to, to Sidon. Jesus went to Sidon with the Syrophoenician woman. There was a Jewish community there, diasporically and so forth. Now, this book of Kishon is where Elijah threw the ashes of the priests of Baal. Remember? After the confrontation on Mount Carmel. Everybody understand? Today, it's still navigable by barges and things like that around Haifa. Around it, it's very polluted, but around its orifice, it's still navigable around Haifa. What's known as the Kleot, the northern industrial suburbs of, of Haifa. It's still there, and it's still navigable there. But as you go in, all the water is taken for irrigation and so forth, and that was just a brook. You know, that's all it is. But biblical times, it was navigable. That's how you get this prophecy. So you can sail around the Sea of Galilee, but you also have some kind of an outlet to the Mediterranean. Okay? Now, why did Jesus dwell in Zebulun and Naphtali? He could have went anywhere. Why didn't he go to Tiberias, which was on the Issachar side and just south of the Issachar side? Why, why, why did he stick to this, this particular region? He never went past Magdalene. Look with me, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 1. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. 
In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan. <coughs> Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. Well, who is this light? We all know from Handel's Messiah, verse 6. <coughs> a child to be born to us, a son given to us. The government will be upon his shoulders or rest upon his shoulders. His name will be called Pele Yoetz, Wonderful Counselor. El Gabor, God Almighty. <coughs> Jesus will be God. Aviad, eternal father, and Sar Shalom, prince of peace. This would be no ordinary kid. It speaks of his deity. He's one with the father. It's going to cause the people in darkness to see a great light, and it's going to cause a land of Israel, of two tribes, that were treated with contempt to be glorified by his presence. Everybody understand the prophecy? Hence, Matthew 4 says he fulfills this prophecy when he moves from Nazareth to Capernaum. Everybody with me? Well, again, we're not just talking about geography. There's more to it than this. Pay attention. See, of Galilee is shaped like a harp. It's called Kenedit from Kenur, harp in Hebrew. Jesus confines himself to this area. This is the sea. It's just a big lake, 15 miles. I know I'm terrible. <laughs> Capernaum. Yeah. Okay. Magdalene. Here. Gensari, where he cast the devils out here. And here is Bethsaida. The upper Jordan coming from the tribe of Dan. Yardan, Yardan, going down from Dan. It continues on the south of the Sea of Galilee, but it flows into the north of the Sea of Galilee from Jordan, from Dan and from the mount, melting snow caps of Mount Hermon into something known as the Hulda Basin, which is not there anymore, the water's gone, but into the Sea of Galilee, it's the Upper Jordan. <coughs> this separates Galilee from Galilee of the Gentiles. That's why it's here Jesus cast the pigs, the demons into the pigs. You'd have no pigs in the Jewish neighborhood. They were in kosher, you understand? This galley of the Gentiles. Please treat with contempt. Okay. This is where it comes. The Roman road from Tiberius would have went that way. Okay. Well, let's understand now. Why? Why? That's the geography. Well, some of the geography. There's meaning in the tribes, there's meaning in the geography. Always. Everybody understand. Some of the apostles came from Bethsaida. It means the uh, house of the hunter. Turn with me, please, to Judges chapter 5. The history of the tribe is played out from Jacob's prophecy. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a little Jewish girl named Miriam. She did not have blonde hair and blue eyes, and her name was not Mother Mary. Her name was Miriam. Same name as the sister of Moses, and it means bitter. Bitter. Remember the prophecy of Simeon, a sword would pierce your own heart? And 
this little Jewish girl named Miriam grew up in Nazareth. In northern Israel, separating Samaria from Galilee is a long valley that runs from east to west. Picture it as this room. That valley is known in Hebrew as Emek Israel or the Valley of Jezreel. People in the West misinterpret it as the Valley of Armageddon. That's completely wrong. Armageddon comes from the Hebrew Har Megiddo. Har Megiddo. The Mount. Mount is Har. Har Megiddo. The Mount of Megiddo. The valley is what's underneath it. It overlooks it. Now, if I was on the eastern end of the valley of Jezreel, it would be Har Gilboa, Mount Gilboa, where Saul and his sons were hung on the walls of Bet Shan when they were killed on Mount Gilboa. Okay? That's, uh, that's the mountain, that's the border on the east end, approximately here. This one. On the west is Har Carmel. Har Carmel, Mount Carmel. Actually, a small mountain range is the border on the west on the western axis. Mount Carmel separates the Mediterranean from the valley. If you've been to Israel, it's just right next to Haifa on the south. Okay. In fact, Haifa is built on the northern slope of Mount Carmel. So you've got Mount Gilboa on the east, Mount Carmel on the west, Mount Carmel separating the Mediterranean from the valley, and the valley separating Galilee from Samaria. About a third of the way up the valley from the west, there are two mountains, one by that curtain, and one by the curtain that's open, about that distance, in proportion if this was the valley. I don't have a map. Okay. That mountain on the north side, on the Samaria side, is Har Megiddo. Megiddo. Almost 180 degrees due north on the other side of the valley is Har Tabor. Har Tabor. Literally Mount Tabor, meaning umbilical. Mount Tabor is where the story of Deborah takes place. Where Deborah and Yael killed Sisera. Deep meaning for the end times and that stuff, but that's where it happened. Unfortunately, the Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church erroneously say it's the Mount of Transfiguration. It is not. The Mount of Transfiguration is certainly Mount Hermon, Ar Hermon. Ar <coughs> Tavor and Mount Tabor is where the story of Deborah took place. In the shadow of Mount Tabor, and Mount Tabor is interesting, Napoleon went up it when he came to Israel, and he looked down at the Valley of Jezreel and said, this is the perfect place for my ultimate military campaign. Then he went back to Europe, put the emperor's crown on his head, proclaimed himself the emperor of a reunited Europe, and believers in England and Britain thought he was the Antichrist. And he is a type of the Antichrist, historical type. I have a book called Shadows of the Beast. We explain these things. I can only mention it in passing. For the sake of brevity, we won't go into it. But this is where he went. In the shadow of Mount Tabor, right on back of it, walking distance if you've got good boots and you like to hike, is a cliff. 
upon which is a hamlet of Sephoris, maybe 120 people, called Nazareth. So this little Jewish girl, growing up in Nazareth, She's growing up in the shadow of Mount Tabor. It was the outstanding geographical feature of the, of the area. Now in this, from a literary perspective, when you read especially the Septuagint, the Greek translation of this, you see how the Magnificat, what the angel Gabriel told Mary, derives from the song of Deborah. You understand? Look at verse 24. Most blessed of women, blessed are you among women. Sound familiar? So little Miriam, I don't know what they played hopscotch or jump rope, whatever little girls did then, but she would have grown up in the shadow of this Mount Tabor. And she would have known. That's where it happened, Miriam. That's where Deborah was. That's where Yael was. The scriptures tell us, blessed is she among women. Little did this little Jewish girl, Miriam, fathom that by the time she was a teenager, the angel Gabriel from the book of Daniel would have appeared to her and told her, that's only a type, a shadow of you. Blessed are you among women, Miriam. You understand? It must have freaked her out coming from that neighborhood. Nazareth is right in the shadow of it. You can't miss it. It overlooks it. I mean, the, the table overlooks Nazareth, the cliff. You could walk, Again, if you're into hiking, you could walk it. Well, I couldn't, but maybe you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does this tell us then? Let us look, verse 18. In this conflict with Sisera, Zebulun was a people who despised their lives even to death. And Naphtali also on the high places of the field. The kings came and fought. They fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh, near the waters of Megiddo. <coughs> and they took no plunders and silver. The stars fought from heaven. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The torrents of Kishon swept them away. Again, you had tidal currents in the brook of Kishon then. It was a Nahal, a river. It was navigable, separating the tribal areas of Issachar from Zebulun. Everybody understand? Why does Jesus dwell here? Zebulun was a people who despised their lives unto death and Naphtali also. Look with me to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12, please. Verse 23, And Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, <coughs> Bamet, Bamet, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, remains alone, it cannot live. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. That according to the song of Deborah in Judges chapter 5 is the characteristic of Zebulun and Naphtali. 
the people who despise their lives unto death. You hate your life and lose it. You will keep it for life eternal. Unless a seed falls to the earth and dies. This relates to the resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, doesn't it? What comes out of the earth is different than the seed you put in it. Every farmer knows it's catabolism. The seed dies, the shell falls off, and a new creation comes out of it. The outward must die for the inward to come out of the earth. A seed falls to the earth and dies. We become new creations. 1 Corinthians 15, etc. He who hates his life will lose it. That doesn't mean we're suicidal. It just means we hate our lives in this world. The book of Ecclesiastes is God's philosophy of life. We call it in Hebrew, Kohelet. And it tells us, if you like Latin, vanitas vanitatem, omnia vanitas. It's all in vain. You trust in this life, you hope in this life in a fallen world, it's all in vain. A rich person ends up just as dead as a poor one. It doesn't matter how high and mighty you become in this fallen world, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is loving God and keeping His commandments. Don't trust in this place. Trust in the coming kingdom of the Messiah. Trust in life eternal, but don't trust in this. It's all in vain. Make the best of a bad thing. That's what it tells us in Ecclesiastes. Make the best of a bad thing. Don't trust in this place. Backsliding has to do with trusting in this life. Unsaved people trust in this. Look at this poor lady, Nikki. That's what life comes to. Unless the Lord comes first, that's what life comes to. Who? I hate it. I hate watching people die and suffer. I hate it. Look, look what they're doing in this country with the farmers. I, I hate it. Mm -hmm. Telling somebody earlier, this world is becoming too wicked even for guys like me, and I'm crooked. <laughs> I hate it. My mother gave up the ghost in April. I love my mother, but I hated her life in this world what she trusted in, what she believed in. He who hates his life will gain it to life eternal. Zebulun was a people who despised their lives to death. Naphtali also on the high places. Naphtali despised his life. Pay attention. Jesus will always choose to dwell. He can go anywhere he wants. He will choose to dwell among those who hate their life in this world. Do they hate their life? No. Do they hate their life in this world? Yes. <clears throat> Every unsaved person we look at is on their way to eternal perdition. Who needs this joint? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, Maranatha. He will always dwell among those who hate life in this fallen world, who don't trust in it, who don't live for it. It's not their hope. They have a blessed hope, and it's not this place. That's where he's going to dwell. Every lie of the devil, practically, in the Western world now, in the developed world, every lie of the devil, practically, that Satan is using against the church today to try to seduce it, to deceive Christians. Practically every bit of it. 
is to seduce Christians into trusting in this life. Mm. The word faith, the name it and claim it, the blab it and grab it, trust in riches to worship mammon. You don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. Tell that to the persecuted church. Yeah. It's a pack of lies. These people are the false prophets and false teachers Jesus warned would come in the last days. And they're not all American. You've got a homegrown version, Macaulay and Vermeran, and these guys who are just as bad. They're trying to seduce the people of God to trusting in this life. Jesus is not in those churches. He doesn't dwell with those people. You won't find Jesus in those places. Jesus dwells with Mathali and Zebulun. It's a car, that's where he is. <laughs> He's not in word faith churches. He's not in kingdom now, dominionist churches. It's not where he dwells. He could have. But he said, no, I'm going to go to a place that's been treated with contempt and despised. The world will hate you for my name's sake. That's where I'm going to dwell. Says Jesus. Let's look at this further now. First Chronicles chapter 12. Oh, let's continue this. I'm sorry, I forgot it. Verse 19. They took no plunder in silver. Do you see that? The Hebrew word for the precious metal, silver, is kesef. The Hebrew word for money and for currency is kesef. How much money do you have? How much silver do you have? <laughs> same word, same meaning. No distinction whatsoever in Hebrew, either ancient Hebrew or modern. It's the same word. Now, silver is of temporary value, but it's not a non-corrosive metal in, in the sense gold is, is it? It tarnishes everything. It's of temporary value. Gold represents things of eternal value. That's why the inner chambers of the temple were gold. Now, silver has its temporal value. The half shekel of silver for the firstborn. Silver has to do with the price of redemption. Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Silver can be used as a thing of temporal value. But it's not what motivated these guys. They took no plunders. They didn't want that. They weren't in it for the money. They were not in it for the money. Be careful of people who are in ministry for money. Most of them are people who could not make money in a secular business or profession. Therefore, they become Pentecostal preachers. And I'm a Pentecostal. They don't worship God, they worship mammon. Now, there is a gift of philanthropy in the book of Romans 12. But he who gives, gives with, gives with liberality. There are people who have that gift that God shows them how to make money in secular businesses and professions. Why? To fund missions and evangelism and charity and things like that. Sponsor ministries and so forth. There is a gift of philanthropy. Silver has value. Temporary value. I'll tell you about people with the gift of philanthropy. There are three things you're always going to see with them, at least and sometimes four. The first thing somebody has the gift of philanthropy is, in Romans 12, they are not arrogant about their wealth. Many of them you wouldn't know they were minted unless you knew them. Secondly, 
If they lost all their money tomorrow, they would not lose their faith. Thirdly, they all suffered a period of hardship or difficulty at some point in their life, so they would learn to trust the Lord instead of the money, as it says in Deuteronomy 8. The Lord let you be hungry, and then he showed you how to make wealth to confirm the covenant or establish the covenant. And sometimes there's a very conspicuous fourth one. They have some kind of a cross carried that can be quite heavy. That their money can't solve the problem. Could be family, could be health, could be whatever. They have a cross. Why? That cross is there temporarily to cause them to trust Jesus instead of money. Because the natural propensity of the flesh is when you've got a platinum credit card, that's where you put your faith. And you've got crooked preachers who are teaching this, in effect. No lovers of money. They didn't want the silver. They were not in the ministry for the money. It wasn't about that. It's not what they wanted. That's again not to suggest that God cannot bless and prosper his people. He can on his terms for his purposes. <laughs> but it's not about that. Every one of us is indescribably rich because we are co heirs with Christ. You've won a billion dollar lottery. <coughs> the check hasn't arrived yet, but you've been declared the winner. When Jesus comes back, we get paid. Every one of us, every one of us is extravagantly, unimaginably rich. And every one of us is flat, broke, skid. We are only stewards of what the Lord has entrusted us with. We're all broke. Every Christian is flat broke, and every Christian is loaded. Any other mentality is not from God. My favorite rabbi said, Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Nothing will disclose someone's real attitude towards the things of God than their attitude towards money and material wealth. Nothing. I was quite well off as a young person. Very well off at one point in my life. When the Lord called me, he went to full-time ministry and to immigrate to Israel. What do you think was stopping me? And I could really argue. Oh, look at these checks I can write to Christian organizations and his donations. I couldn't do this if I lived in Israel. I'm in New York and I can, I can support. <laughs> I tried to negotiate. There's more Jews in Queens than there are in Tel Aviv. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord had to deal with me. That money. Vacations in Switzerland, flying back and forth to visit my girlfriend, presently my wife in Israel. I didn't care. This is before Skype. I just talked there for hours. The money didn't matter. I touch it from New York. I didn't care. I was loaded. I would have been psychologically better off to have never had had money than to have had money and have to go <laughs> trust God for next month's rent or my tuition to go through seminary. Now, he always provided, praise God. But even as a believer, money had a thing. And I wasn't ever into the word faith thing, you understand. I mean, I worked. Prospered. My favorite rabbi, Efo Levavecha, Shamehye Kamken Otsarecha. Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. 
And of course, my favorite rabbi is Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef. Mina said it. Jesus the Messiah. <laughs> Jesus, Rabbi Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. They didn't love Silva. The Lord will always dwell among those who are no lovers of money. Remember, money's not the problem. We're the problem. The world is the problem. Money's not the problem. We're the problem. Sex is not the problem. The world is the problem. We're the problem. Power is not the problem. The world is the problem. We're the problem. And, of course, the devil. That's the problem. It's not these things in and of themselves. Money, sex, money, power, these things in and of themselves are neutral. They can be used for good or for evil. They're not the problem, we're the problem. These guys are no lovers of money and they despise their lives in this world. That is where Jesus dwelt then and those are they among whom he dwells now. Let's look at First Chronicles 12. <laughs> now it's a big war, a big fight. And the supporters of the house of David gather in Hebron, the place of fellowship, Kitabrut, of the sons of Benjamin, son of the right hand, Saul's kinsmen, 3,000, for until now the greatest portion of them, kept their allegiance to the house of Saul. Only a minority of them were loyal to the house of David. Saul was into power, wasn't he? He was into making his own rules. He even went into the occult, into necromancy, witchcraft. Then he became a murderer. Killed Abiathar the high priest, tried to knock off David because he wanted to keep the power. And the majority followed him. The majority still follow people. Only the minority come out of it. However, when you get to verse 32 of the sons of Issachar, remember that's on the southern shore of the book of, of uh, uh, Kishon, right next to Zebulon and Naphtali. The sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Their chiefs were 200, and all their kinsmen were at their command. Men who understood the times and knew what to do. The book of Daniel chapter 11 tells us in the last days this is going to happen the way it happened with the Maccabees. The whole nation was being seduced, but the Maccabees understood the times and took action and gave understanding to the many and paid a high price for it. What does Jesus say? In the Olivet Discourse, be alert, be alert, watch for these things. Yeah. I was just in Israel two weeks ago, these things, man. <laughs> On Tisha B'Av, the first and second temple were destroyed the same days. Jews read the Book of Lamentations, the Megillah Echa, ritually, on Tisha B'Av, and they have a fast. Commemorating the destruction of the temple, the day of fasting and mourning, national disaster, the Holocaust, the crystal knock in, in, in Munich began on Tisha B'Av. The Jews were expelled from England on Tisha B'Av in the 12th century. Spanish Inquisition began on the, the Shah Ba'av and many other disasters 
in the histories of the Jews. Both temples destroyed the same day, the first by the Babylonians, the second by the Romans. The mystery religions of Babylon were now housed in the pantheon of Rome by a Pergamum, separate subject, as it is. And we in the Megiddo Ahab, the book of the, the Lamentations, Jeremiah's weeping. Oh, how the stones lay fallen. Right? This is what it says. This year, the Shabbat, as soon as they finished the fast and rolled up the scroll for reading Lamentations, a hundred kilo stone fell out of the whirling wall and crashed into the pavement at the Kotel. This fell out. Balloons with incendiary devices coming across from Gaza, destroying thousands of acres of fire. Now they're shooting Katusha rockets again at Israeli civilians and using their own civilians as human shields. So when the Israelis shoot back, CNN and BBC will come in and say, see what the Jews did? <laughs> Collateral damage. They actually store rockets in schools and hospitals and fire them right next to civilian areas. So when the Israelis fire back, it's inevitable you kill civilians. And then the media is more than happy to say, look at this. These events in the Middle East fulfill prophecy. European Union is in dire straits financially and politically. After Brexit, after the economic crisis in countries like Italy and Spain and Greece, Daniel says the iron does not stick to the clay. They don't adhere to each other, but they try to make it happen. The ecumenical movement, the new apostolic reformation, the stage is being set for the Antichrist. Be alert, Jesus said, watch for these things. Jews are believing in Jesus again in numbers not seen since the second century. I remember there were 200 Jewish believers in Israel. Now there are individual congregations with more than that. The thousands. Just in my lifetime thus far. And more coming all the time. A natural branch is being grafted in again. Watch for these signs. Jesus said, be alert. Jesus said, Twice to be alert. Watch for this stuff. But Satan has a liar on his payroll. A man whose message comes from the pit of hell. He is on Satan's payroll. This man says, avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. Forget about what Jesus said. Forget about what Paul said. Other gods are demons, the monoi. Forget about what Moses said. Other gods are shadim, devils. Ari Krishna is a devil. Rama Shitra Shiva is a devil. All of the Nabataean moon gods are devil. Forget about what Moses and Paul said. We have to unite with all religions in order to bring in worldwide peace. We have to unite with demon worshippers to bring in worldwide peace. This is the Antichrist agenda. Of whom do I speak? Rick Warren. Who needs the New Testament if you have the purpose-driven lie? That man is on Satan's payroll. Don't take my word for it. Google it and read it for yourself. Revelation 14.11 Those who take the mark of the beast, the smoke of their torment, goes up and now tau and now nades. Forever and ever, literally from age to ages. The Greek translation of the Hebrew, olame olamim. Those who take the mark of the beast and worship his image. Smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Whoever takes it, it says whoever. Revelation 24 those who take the mark of the beast will not be in the resurrection of the righteous. 
What do you do with somebody who says, Oh no, that's wrong. It will be possible to take the mark of the beast, sell your soul to Satan, worship the Antichrist, worship the image of the beast at the behest of the false prophet, and still be born again, get saved, and go to heaven. John Mongotha! Don't take my word. Watch him say it on YouTube. If possible, the elect will be deceived. But the men of Issachar will understand the times and know what to do about it. Then we read. Verse 33 of Zebulun. There were 50,000 who went out in the army who could draw up in battle formation with all kinds of weapons of war who helped David, a type of Christ. David is a shadow of Jesus as king and good shepherd. With an undivided heart. It was Zebulun who had an undivided heart. And of Naphtali, there were a thousand captains and with them 37,000 with shield and spear. <clears throat> of all the tribes who contributed the most fighters to the house of David, to the cause of God. David, an Old Testament shadow of Jesus as king. Who? Issachar. Naphtali and Zebulun. Those who have not loved their lives in this world even unto death. Those who are no lovers of money, they will always be the ones who God uses the most, who will put up the most fighters. In fact, when we get to verse 40, look what it says. More over those who were near to them, even as far as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali, brought food on donkeys, camels, mules, and on oxen, great quantities of flour cakes, fig cakes, and bunches of raisins, wine, oil, oxen, and sheep. There was joy indeed in Israel. Now, we don't have any silver now, maybe. And if we do, we're only managers of it. Despise our lives in this world, but there will be joy in Israel when Jesus reigns from the throne of David during the millennium. And then things get really good for all eternity. For Naphtali, for Issachar, for Zebulun. Look. Not only did they contribute the most fighters, they fed the other tribes. They equipped the other tribes, didn't they? That's why Jesus dwelt with Zebulun and Naphtali. That's why his ministry went from Issachar to Zebulun and Naphtali. That's why. That's where he dwelt. That's with whom he dwelt. And that is where, and those are those with whom he still dwells today. God bless. Have a break now in a few minutes.